some silly reviewers have very foolishly described this movie as Die Hard in a Mall. I, they did it on purpose. They forced it because uh, the director of this movie is Rennie Harlan, and Rennie Harlan directed Die Hard 2. So if it hadn't been for that, they, they wouldn't have made the comparison. Hello, hello, I'm Vernon and this is Kit, and we just watched Bodies at Rest. Or for those of you Chinese viewers, it's called Cheng Mo the Zheng Ren. It also translates back into Silent Witnesses. Kit, what did we just watch? We watched a rather entertaining bad guys uh, chasing after the guys who are locked in a building uh, crime drama. In other words, it's CSI, Home Alone episode. Very unfortunately for pathologists, or coroners, or forensic experts, there's a murder victim in the morgue, and the people who murdered the, the poor corpse want to get the bullet out of her, so that they can't be traced or identified. Basically, on Christmas Eve, just as a typhoon is about to crash into Hong Kong, a mock is laid siege by three masked criminals. They break into the mock, take the pathologist and his assistant hostage. They demand that the pathologist hand over the corpse, extract the bullet out of the corpse and give the bullet to them. And no one will be hurt. And that's it. It's a very simple operation. The bad guys expect to be home. Uh, in less than an hour. Since this is a thriller movie, nothing goes to plan. Nobody follows their instructions, including themselves. So the experienced pathologist, uh, Nikki Chung, outwits them. In true Home Alone fashion, the Hong Kong version of CSI basically has the, C has the forensic people or pathologists, all the back-end people, solving the crimes on their own and also always, almost always getting involved in fisticuffs and confrontations with the criminals at the end. It's a Hong Kong thing. Based on this rather simple sounding premise, we managed uh, to weave uh, quite a lot of uh, twists and plot complexity into it. Uh, even though they are, the, most of the show, they are trapped uh, inside the mall. Which makes this almost very classic limited location thriller. I can't think of any examples right now, but uh, I think all of us have seen uh, similar movies uh, over the past few decades. This, this kind of uh, story doesn't seem to have fallen out of favor, even though they haven't really been uh, big blockbusters uh, either. At least not for the past decade. Um, I remember there was Die Hard on a plane, <laughs> Die Hard on, uh, in a hotel, and then Die Hard on a bus. I wouldn't call this a, a Die Hard uh, ki kind of uh, movie. Although some silly reviewers have very foolishly described this movie as Die Hard in a mall. I, they did it on purpose. They forced it because uh, the director of this movie is Rennie Harlan, and Rennie Harlan directed Die Hard 2. So if it hadn't been for that, they, they wouldn't have made the comparison. The, the production side of this movie has a very uh, interesting a very uh, complicated uh, background. It actually started off as an American uh, Hollywood uh, script. Which was bought over by Wenders Studios in China. They translated the script into Chinese and then left it sitting there because they realized that it's not going to strike a nerve with Chinese audiences. Okay, and then uh, Rennie Harlan got on board. The Chinese studio gave him a script and then retranslated it back to English for him and he took a look at it and said, oh, doesn't work. Tell you what, I'll rewrite the script, put it in a Chinese Hong Kong context and then have your Chinese guys translate it back into Mandarin for you. That script became the film. And uh, some of the people working on the script, uh, according to Rennie Harlan in an interview, uh, actually young uh, Chinese uh, filmmakers who studied filmmaking in America. So they are, there's a lot of American influence uh, in uh, the script. Which kind of makes it feel very well polished on one hand, but makes it feel very dated on the other hand. Dated? Dated, as in this is the sort of movie that we used to watch a lot in the 80s, but not these days. I, I would call it timeless. I would call it outdated and obsolete. 
But that's a problem with Rennie Harlan, you see. He's always the right man at the wrong time and the wrong place. The main reason why I wanted to watch this movie was because Rennie Harlan directed. And uh, it's not just because Rennie Harlan uh, directed uh, big movies like uh, Die Hard uh, 2, but uh, because he has uh, had a very interesting career, he, uh, his career uh, kind of crashed after the double failures of uh, Cutthroat Island and The Long Kiss Goodnight. Which bankrupted two studios in straight succession. Rennie Harlan made completely decent, great, if not decent, thriller and action movies, which ended up going over budget and allegedly, or maybe as an excuse, the studios declared bankruptcy but afterwards. They also underperformed uh, at the box office. I mean, The Long Kiss Goodnight uh, had a very expensive uh, script uh, written by Shane Black, who was at the top of his uh, career then. After Die Hard 2, uh, Rennie Harlan directed Cliffhanger, excellent Sylvester Stallone movie. And uh, even after The Long Kiss Goodnight, um, we did Deep Blue Sea, which was a low-budget movie, but which was uh, also, I, I thought it was a good movie. Uh, driven is is a bit mixed. Uh, that is uh, Stallone's uh, Formula One uh, movie. He also did Mine Hunters. Uh, Not the current TV series on cable right now, but the movie. Catherine Morris was in it, the cold case lady, and it's about these uh, FBI uh, profilers who are caught on this island with a real-life serial killer who's hunting them. Five Days of War, which was a, <laughs> a very uh, anti-Russian uh, propaganda war movie. But, but the thing is, he, he's done a lot of uh, interesting movies and he didn't give up after uh, he, uh, he, he kind of crashed as, as a big-time director, unlike people like uh, Jan de Bont, who never made another movie after Speed 2. So, I mean, you've you got to respect him, you know, it, it must be a, a huge loss of face uh, for him to work on, on these small budget movies. But he kept at it because I, I guess he must really love the craft. The love of his craft really shows he's a very competent, visually, and very visually engaging director. I, I call him the right director at the wrong time, at the wrong place, because if you watch Cutthroat Island, it it's basically Pirates of the Caribbean without the madness of Johnny Depp, but it's almost in the same spirit, except wrong time, wrong place. As a director, Rennie Harlan did nothing wrong. Just that, you know... Well, he went it way didn't over pan, budget. <laughs> it, it didn't pan out for that period. Uh, the Long Kiss Goodnight is a very interesting movie. You should go and watch it if you haven't. Uh, it was uh, written by Shane Black. Uh, at the height of his career, it was a very expensive script. Uh, he wrote Lethal Weapon, that was his huge hit. He also wrote The Last Boy Scout, which uh, wasn't uh, a Bruce Willis movie that didn't do too well, but I, I think it's an excellent movie. And of course, he's more famous now recently for directing uh, Iron Man 3. So it's that sort of competence that Rennie Harlan brings to, these, to this particular Hong Kong China production. In, in the low budget, uh, shot in one location, uh, low budget kind of movie, that the kind of movie that Shyamalan uh, made uh, after uh, his box office failures too. As a sign of his competence, Rennie Harlan, unlike M. Night, actually delivered this small budget film under budget. Shyamalan went over budget? Yeah, he went over budget for the last two. There was one false uh, note in the movie where they have like this uh, imagined uh, sequence which I thought was a bit of a cheat. Uh, it, you think that something's happening but uh, it doesn't happen in real life. It's actually uh, in the hero's uh, imagination. I, I thought that was unnecessary. Our hero pathologist imagines what would happen if he tried to tip off a visiting cop per genre convention and as per genre convention, the cop gets himself killed. Uh, which genre are we talking about? This genre convention actually comes up more in slasher flicks. You know, usually where we're halfway during the film, there's always an authority figure, a sheriff or a cop who knocks on the door of the house, the creepy house on the hill where all the 
kidnap people are and where all the victims are held and then promptly gets killed off. Yeah, but it's not an imagined sequence, right? It happens... It uh, happens in those films, in those genres, but in this film, it's sort of like an in-genre joke. I felt cheated. Uh, it was like a, a cheap trick pulled on the audience, so I, I, I didn't like it. Yeah, I mean, for a genre-savvy audience who are in on the joke that this is a convention from a different genre of film altogether, this is kind of funny, but totally not expected for this particular genre, which is why you would feel cheated. I seriously can't imagine that a competent director and basically script doctor like Rennie Harlan would actually put this idea in this film. I think it must have been from the film students that he <laughs> passed the script on to. Uh, because there are uh, rather spectacular uh, action sequences in this imagined uh, uh, path. So it, it could be an excuse to put in some action into the movie. The suspense uh, does feel real. You do fear for the two, uh, the hero and the heroine. Um, but only because Richie Ren dials up his villainous character up to 11. But also because they show good guys getting killed. So uh, it shows that the the bad guys are serious and are willing to kill people. Of course, it's never the important good guys who are killed. It's just the minor characters like the visiting cop in the fantasy sequence or the security guard in the main movie. Yeah, so there's just enough of uh, danger there to give a little spice to the movie. But of course, if they actually killed off any of the, the real uh, major good guys, the audience would really be upset. And uh, yeah, they don't do it. For technical uh, nitpicks, uh, the way the recovered bullets uh, look uh, is uh, not realistic. Uh, bullets, uh, if they hit bone especially, they will shatter into many pieces. The bullets and the bones as well, but bullets will be shattered. But uh, even uh, if they don't hit bone, only if they only hit uh, soft tissue, the bullets are actually uh, designed to mushroom, the heads uh, expand to cause uh, even more uh, tissue damage. Basically, the bullets that are retrieved from the bodies in this movie look too clean and unused. They're pristine, they're shiny and smooth. Especially one uh, was supposed to be a hollow point bullet, and the hollow point bullet is designed to really expand more than a normal uh, sharp point bullet. Uh, it would be unrecognizable. My money though is on this movie not getting released in China at all. Uh, because of politics? Because of politics. The, bad, the three bad guys are actually Hong Kong cops. Now, could you imagine right in the middle of the Hong Kong pro-democracy protests where the Hong Kong cops have been criminal in their action to suppress the movement that the Chinese would allow this film to be released? I, I, allow it to be a box office success? I'd say no. Uh, these are like individual criminals. It's not like system, systemic uh, corruption uh, in or uh, bad behavior by the entire department. So I, I don't see any problem. Well, it's a bad behavior by an entire group of Hong Kong policemen who work together. If the Hong Kong protests remain at this pitch, my money is on this movie getting buried in China. I say this movie will, will be released within six months from now in mainland China. You know, this movie is getting released in non-Chinese territories in Southeast Asia today. So if it takes six months for a China finance movie to get released in China, Obviously, something is really wrong. But uh, yeah, the production side is interesting. This is uh, mainly a ch China production. And uh, obviously, R Rennie Harlan is a Hollywood director, even though he's Finnish. Uh, he, he is Finnish, as in he comes from Finland. But also, he's Finnish because like what Kit says, Hollywood doesn't pass big budget scripts to him anymore these days. So, uh, it, it's hard to really uh, summarize the plot. But there are a lot of uh, like small details and twists and plot progressions 
that uh, do keep uh, the pacing uh, going? That is, if you're used to Hong Kong film pacing, this is not Hollywood film pacing for sure. Oh, I, I, I thought this was uh, way better than the average uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, crime drama. It, uh, probably because uh, Renny Harlan worked on the script first. And it also started off as an American uh, spec script. My thought on the film is that it's very competent, very decently done, but, you know, why on earth did Renny Harlan need to make this film? Because it seems like, even though it's an improvement over the Hong Kong genre film, it's really a step backwards because for a long time, Hong Kong film industry has kind of worked and succeeded towards telling Hong Kong style stories, Hong Kong movie genres that are almost unique to Hong Kong. For a while, uh, China Hong Kong productions have been quite interesting during the period where certain Hong Kong directors made pseudo westerns set in the Chinese Republican period. Uh, th this is actually uh, Renny Harlan's uh, third uh, movie that was uh, made in China. His first one was five years ago where he uh, made a Jackie Chan movie. Flashpoint. Then he made a second movie which uh, didn't do well at all. But did it bankrupt a Chinese studio? No. He got lucky. Uh, he got smart. Yeah, I, th I think he's staying away from big budget movies uh, now. It's a good movie. but It is genuinely good. I agree with you. But uh, I, I think uh, it didn't... I expected Rennie Harlan to choose a more uh, ambitious uh, script. Story-wise, not budget-wise, of course. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this seemed a bit uh, too conventional uh, for him. Uh, it, it, it's, it's well done. It's, it's just that uh, maybe anybody could have, could have made a movie like this. And frankly speaking, he could have made this movie in Hollywood. Anyway, if you're a Rennie Harlan fan, or even if you're not, uh, this would be a good way uh, to discover uh, such a dedicated uh, director with such a, a long uh, career. Yeah, so it's definitely worth watching, but uh, not necessarily uh, so great that you, you should go out of your way to try and uh, track it down. And that's all we got. Bye.